This is a wind up girl of book reviews was published in 09. Set in Thailand in a dark near future day. The rising seas and burned all fossil fuels away. Hi, I'm Michael Everts, and this is Fit to be Read. The Wind Up Girl stands out as a gem of the cyberpunk biopunk subgenre of science fiction literature. This novel by Paolo Bacci Galupi breaks new ground in science fiction and delivers a riveting, page turning, fit to be read reading experience. I recommend this novel to science fiction fans who enjoy dystopian or cyberpunk themes and are eager or open to explore new ground in those atmospheres. This is an easy book to recommend. It will not disappoint. Replace cyberspace with seed banks and genetic manipulation and you've got the initial premise for this not too far future world. The Wind Up Girl is a great read for those hungry for science fiction not centered on the West and stories where the technology presented is at least as much biotech as machine tech. There are moments of profound sexual abuse in the novel in case that's something that you wish to avoid in your reading experience. As with each review on this channel, the episode will begin with a spoiler-free review, character analysis, and plot summary to introduce you to this novel. Following the summary, I'll announce a five likes and five dislikes segment that will include spoilers for those who've read the novel and are still thinking about it. Engage with me in the comment section and let me know if you've read this novel or if based on the spoiler free introduction, you think you might pick it up. Published in 2009, Bachi Galupi's The Wind Up Girl is set in a very dark future Bangkok. In this dystopian world, the Monsantos or seed and agricultural companies of the world control everything because food, or more specifically calories, are hard to come by. This area of Thailand fights to remain a lone beacon of independence from the full influence and pull of these ruthless mega corporations. The kingdom's treasure, their pure and unmolested sea bank, is highly sought after by the unscrupulous Farangs, or seedy opportunistic western representatives of the calorie companies. The kingdom also faces an internal conflict as there exists a power struggle between the kingdom's trade ministry and its environmental ministry. The world presented is a wasteland. Food supplies are minimal and susceptible to various diseases, including most notably blister rust and sibiscosis. The calorie companies are pumping out as much GMO foodstuffs and sterile seeds as they can to try to keep ahead of the inevitable blister rust. The impact of accessing the kingdom's seed bank would be immeasurable. The city is surrounded by a wall that barely succeeds at protecting the city from rising sea levels. In this dark future, natural resources, namely oil and natural gases, have been exhausted. Sources of energy are limited to manpower, kink springs, a rough technology from Bachi Galupi's imagination, and for the fortunate elites, coal burning. Among other technologies featured in the novels are dirigible and megadons. Dirigibles are basically blimps used for cargo transport, and megadons are genetically modified and enhanced elephants of great size and strength and are important to industry and thus the economy. Also biologically modified are the new people, the wind-ups. In the novel, approximately four POVs are shared in sort of alternating chapters. One of those four POVs is that of the Miko, a wind-up. Wind-ups were developed in Japan. They're illegal in Bangkok, and since Amiko was abandoned in Bangkok, she has no choice but to serve a dirtbag strip club owner named Raleigh, who bribes the powers that be to look the other way. Wind-up girls initially created to be submissive geishas of a sort are genetically designed to serve their masters and to orgasm when stimulated, whether they like it or not. Amiko is constantly abused and sexually humiliated by patrons of the club in deplorable and horrific ways. We wince an understatement at the abuse that she suffers, and we root for her to escape to an area where other windups are rumored to be living free of oppression. Other notable characters are JD, also known as the Tiger of Bangkok. 
He is a representative of the environmental ministry, also known as the White Shirts. He is passionate about the purity of Bangkok and does what he can to disrupt or be a thorn in the side of the trade ministry, most often referred to as just trade, and to the Farangs and the calorie companies they represent. Kanya is a white shirt captain and works closely with Jadi. Anderson Lane, a representative from behemoth calorie company Agrigen, runs a factory that appears to manufacture king springs. We know from the get-go that Lane has an agenda, and that agenda is intertwined with the political power struggle between trade and environmental. Finally is Hak Seng. Hak Seng is a yellow card who works for Lane at the Kingsbury factory. Yellow card is a name given to Chinese refugees living in Bangkok. They are looked down upon and have almost no prospects for a better life beyond living in a slum and trying to stay alive. The wind-up girl is vivid imagery, post-oil industry, East versus West, fast-paced and exciting, industrial espionage, shocking, at times beautiful, and at times displays the worst parts of humanity. To read the novel is to page after page anticipate ecological collapse while holding on to just a shred of hope that a hero might emerge. Anticipate this. Here comes my five likes and five dislikes, including spoilers for Paolo Bacci Galupi's The Wind-Up Girl. Like number one. The POV splits are fantastic. The splits, length of chapters, and division of action has a similar feel to the Expanse series. While I enjoy the Expanse books, the POVs and Wind-Up Girl immediately display more depth. The stakes are so profound and personal. Like number two, I'm doubling down on the POV chapters. I'm not looking forward to one more than another. Each time a chapter ends, the anticipation is heavy for whichever character is up next. It doesn't matter who's up next, there's no lull in any of the POVs. It's especially clever that once Jadi is dead, the Kanya POV takes over. Everything in their world is a desperate situation, and that comes across in each storyline. Dislike number one, for me, it felt like Asians, Thai, Chinese, Japanese character representation is a bit shortchanged in the book. It's acceptable that everyone is a victim considering the landscape, but it's sort of one note that each character is hopeless and defeated. Dislike number two, it seems as if there would be at least a handful of people in Bangkok that would see humanity in the new people and be empathetic towards them. That they are demeaned, loathed, and discarded serves the story well, but it seems unlikely that they wouldn't encounter any pockets of empathy. Dislike number three, Jadis ghost is an unwelcome presence, it diminishes Kanye's character for me. Like number three, it's so good that halfway through, I'm upset that I know it's gonna come to an end. There's so much more left of this world to explore. Dislike number four, it wasn't longer. The story was too succinct. There's a message that the book was attempting to convey, and it got about halfway there. Like good dystopian fare, it felt as if it wanted to deliver warnings of a potential future, but it stopped short of fully satisfying that. Like number four, foreign language and new made-up terms added richness to the story. It was just enough to enrich a great science fiction feel in a foreign land without slowing down the reading experience or confusing the dialogue. Like number five, the world building was solid. Bangkok and the King Spring factories were especially vivid in my mind. I had no trouble picturing Megadons, dirigibles, and Cheshires. The factory wasn't just a factory. I can see the workers laboring under difficult conditions. I can picture Lake's office upstairs. I can see the algae baths and the foam or lack of foam. I really felt that I was taken inside of this kingdom and inside that factory. Dislike number five, anyone can see that Lake is detestable. I don't think that Bachi Galupi needs to point it out any further in the story, but he does sort of bury the lead on it. All of the other people who have wronged and demeaned Amiko get their moment of being really called out and taken to task. Lake seems to escape this treatment and it's sort of glossed over that he basically pimps her out to be abused by the other powerful men, even though he knows better. It almost borders on attempting to claim that he's redeemable because sometimes he's a human being toward her. This missed the mark. Thank you for watching. I'm Michael Leverts and this is Fit to be Read.